afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Mark Thomas. I'm Head of Investment Companies here at Hardman, and welcome to the latest edition of Hardman Talks. Uh, very pleased today to be joined by Stephen Tredgett, a partner at Oakley Capital, and Alice Nichols from their investor relations team. Just firstly, a brief introduction to Oakley Capital Investments, OCI. Looking through all the legal structure and the terminology, it's a direct investor in a concentrated portfolio of private companies in a very narrow set of sectors. Yeah, in that way, if we think of some of the better known names, it's comparable to a 3i, a HGT or, or an Apex Global. The important message is really that it's a direct investor and that's what you're buying into. It's not a fund of funds. So the first issue that we really focused on in our note was about the sustainability of returns in downturns from private equity. To be honest, we've banged on about that and pretty much every private equity note we've written in the past several years. But I think what's important is to actually understand why that's the case. What private equity brings to the party is competitive advantages. It brings operational expertise so you can manage through things like HR issues, you can take experiences from one country that's early in COVID across to another country. It brings financial strength, which means for the operating companies, they can, have, they can go about doing the normal, much more of the normal course of business rather than having to run around and try and scramble around on, in terms of their own liquidity. Um, what it also brings is, is, is really that focus on the long term. If you think of a private equity fund, it's typically investing for five to seven years, which means they have to think about the next downturn every time they're making an investment because their own returns are driven by it. And if they ever want to raise any more money from, from, from potential investors, yeah, they have to deliver those through cycle returns. So there's some pretty fundamental real drivers why private equity is outperformed across many downturns, across virtually all the five tractor vehicles that you could possibly look at. But looking more specifically in 2020, Stephen, do you want know, to perhaps take us through the results and just highlight how that's, that's worked for you? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Mark, for inviting us to, to join today. And, and thanks for that introduction. And thank you for the, um, for the audience for, 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 enjoying, for, for joining us for this chat. Um, we, we've pre we prepared the odd slide where we knew a question in advance just to kind of help us and Mark assures us most people prefer to look at that than our faces, which is disappointing to hear. And, uh, and Alice will bring those up on occasion. I'll, I'll keep the, that, the quick overview of the results at a high level because I, I suspect most um, on this call will be familiar with them. Um, but essentially, um, last year, we, um, we grew our net asset value to um, 728 million. Um, and that was an NAV per share of, of 403 pence. And we announced that um, in, um, in early March. And so we grew our net per share by 48 pence, paid a dividend of four and a half pence in the year. And that led to a total NAV return of about 18%. 18%. And look, Mark, Mark has said it in his introduction, he's, he's also referenced it in, in his notes, that, uh, that I think the nice thing about this is it's, it's a sustained performance. We, we've delivered again in line with our average compound growth, a similar return as we've returned over the last five years. Um, and as we'll go on to discuss, we're, we're pretty confident about our ability to continue um, to deliver those type of returns. And that performance, has really been underpinned by the fact that our, that our companies typically have a focus on delivering their services or um, products digitally. However, I think the pleasing thing about that 2020 performance is that we've achieved that despite the fact that we, we like many investors, you know, incurred or, or, or suffered some kind of pandemic headwinds um, in, in the last 12 months. And, and we'll talk about some of those headwinds, but it's the idea that we have delivered that despite the fact that you know, a number of our companies wouldn't have, wouldn't have performed um, to budget. Um, just to kind of talk about maybe some of the key drivers, positive or negative of, of that NAV movement, kind of breaking them down into, into five kind of key areas. I, I think the number one driver for us 
in the value of any portfolio company whilst we hold it for certainly is the EBITDA growth. And that average EBITDA growth over the last year was 20%. Now, I think that is a perfectly acceptable, attractive EBITDA growth. It's actually lower than you might anticipate from an Oakley um, portfolio of companies. The last years have been 28% and 30% respectively, 2019, 2018. But still, um, despite the, you know, in, in spite of the year we just had, those companies did have that kind of return. That's one of the larger contributors. The other big contributor to NAV growth has been exits. And no doubt Mark will get stuck into this particular topic, but um, the premiums achieved um, to book value in, in uh, 2020 was 89%. Now, as we discussed, that, that's not our average premium. The average premium since inception is something more like 44%. But there's clearly a release of value at the point of exit. Um, and, and that's been one of the bigger drivers um, of the year just gone to the NAV. Share buybacks, we had, we, we maintain a share buyback program. Um, and as a result of that program last year, we added about 12 and a half pence um, to, to um, NAV in that period. So what's held back the performance? Well, seven of the um, 17 companies in the portfolio, at least that was the number at year end, it's now 19, um, would have suffered some, some kind of headwind as a result of, of COVID. Um, and we'll touch on that um, just shortly. And the other thing that's kind of has been a drag, it was, it was a big positive um, at the start of the year we sold in 2020, we sold two large investments which delivered us a large inflow of cash up into OCI, right into the teeth of the pandemic. Now, it's hard to recall how we felt about the pandemic in March, but, but at that point, we had no idea what we were up against. We had no idea what the short, medium, long-term impact on our portfolio companies would be, um, or the duration of it, or when a vaccine was possible, or any of these kind of features. Um, and as a consequence, having cash then was a, was a particularly beneficial position to be in. As it transpired, only one of our companies required funding. Um, and that, you know, the, the, the cash that sits there now is essentially ready to be drawn into the funds as the funds um, start, you know, continue to make investments. But clearly in the year, having 38% or up to 38%, it finished the year about 30% of your NAV in cash um, it is, is understandably seen as a, as a reasonable drag on performance because you're not getting any return on the, uh, on the cash while it sits there. Um, so ju just to kind of before I hand back to, to Mark, if we just look briefly at the portfolio and how, it's, um, how it performed um, as a result of COVID, we've kind of divided the portfolio of 17 companies into, into buckets which kind of reveal the kind of COVID impact they did or didn't suffer. Um, now, the lion's share of the NAV, so I mean, actually, if you just interestingly, if you broke this, this set of companies up into their sectors, actually, they broadly, we evenly split, relatively evenly split between technology, consumer and education, kind of focus sectors for Oakley. Here, and, and I guess it what demonstrates the fact that the common element not, is not necessarily the sectors they sit in, but the digital technology element of the companies that is actually the kind of overriding um, feature that, that, that runs across most of the portfolio shows that the majority of the portfolio, 10 of those 17 companies experienced no impact or in fact a positive impact of COVID as a result of technology solutions being um, quicker to be adopted as a result of, of, of people and businesses being in containment. Uh, and so that kind of first bucket includes the likes of business service software, web hosting related businesses, online um, consumer platforms and, and, and education technology. The kind of businesses that um, provide, have provided solutions that have been you know, functional and effective um, during COVID. In that modest distribution, uh, modest impact um, bucket there are um, telecoms and, and education businesses that experience some form of disruption compared to what we expected their financial performance to be. But we, uh, and that's probably because new business wind or sales cycles have been lengthened or enrollments have been disrupted during that period. But as soon as social restrictions have lifted, 
we've seen the businesses pretty quickly return to normal. It's a case of not having access to a site, not being able to go on premise to deliver a solution has been the, the, the function of the disruption rather than any change in consumer behavior. And then finally, in the significant impact bucket, it, uh, are those that you know, have a more direct relationship with their physical relationship with the, with the customer, and they have some kind of physical footprint and that physical footprint has been shut for the, for a large swathes of 2021, sorry, 2020, and is still and still in that position in, in 2021, with no obvious clear um, horizon as for when normal trading immediately resumes. And clearly, there's other factors at play rather than containment. There's issues of travel, tourism. You know, and a number of other elements that won't immediately turn to a to a full run rate just because lockdowns ease or vaccinations roll out. The real standout was the was the underlying EBITDA. That I mean, it's a standout for me because it's what I've been banging on about in advance and through the whole of the COVID crisis. Um, if we look at that twenty percent, if we take a global PE average, I think it'd probably be more like fifteen. But if we compare that to the MSCI, it's actually nearly a 40% operational earning EBITDA growth outperformance in one year. So that to me is the real, real standout. Now, on my introduction, I touched on various things about how PE can, can help the companies through a downturn. Stephen, can you perhaps give an example of, of how that's worked for you? Um, in, in terms of helping companies through a downturn, I mean, look, we, a downturn in itself is not something we've had to really kind of consider or consider or wrestle with because it's more around about business interruption. And in most cases, we've not had to concern ourselves with, with business interruption. But over the last year, I guess, one of the great things about having a portfolio of companies, and particularly as kind of COVID struck, you have a wealth of experience and information coming to you from different companies and basically what they're experiencing in different geographies and potentially experiencing that before other geographies are going to experience it. And also kind of solving for the solution in one company such that we can use that experience um, in other companies. Clearly for many, that's been, you know, guidance around how to move, how to become digital if necessary, uh, where to employ if necessary, also providing kind of HR, health and safety, you know, kind of guidance where we might just have more resource and experience in that, in that particular area. Um, so in a COVID context, it's been around shared experience. And also, frankly, in a, in a period of uncertainty, sometimes a CEO just needs a sounding board and to know that their financial partner is right behind them, very supportive. We let all our portfolio companies know that there were facilities available to them if they needed them. Um, now, we, we, we were lucky that that wasn't, wasn't required um, in, um, in the majority of cases, but it's a reassuring position to be in, that that's one of the things you don't have to be concerned about as a CEO, and that ultimately you can focus on doing what you do best in terms of the performance of the company. Great. I mean, as always, I think a lot of commentators tend to focus on, on the negative, whether it's you know, Russia for harbour, but you can always find something that's going wrong. And you know, you've highlighted TMO. Uh, we've already had a question actually on, on it um, yeah, live uh, from, from Richard. So thank you for the question, Richard. What can you tell us about where we stand on TMO, where you stand on TMO, outlooks, et cetera? Uh, so timeout, yes. I mean, I think the first thing to state is that timeout is a is a listed company, unusual and not typical and not something we would, you know, we, we found ourselves in that position because it was a, is a good way to access additional growth capital for the business, but that certainly wouldn't be the norm for us. Um, and Timeout reports its results on next Tuesday, the 30th of March. The, the current status of the business is um, that all, mar all markets except for Miami are currently closed. Um, and for those that aren't familiar, Time Out launched a very successful food, drink and cultural market solution. Um, started in 2014, but has really um, grown in traction through 2019 as we opened another five sites. Um, and that really is about 
having a physical version of Time Out Under One Roof. Clearly the doors have been closed on those operations intermittently and certainly at the moment. Um, and we should hope that those doors reopen again in, you know, kind of spring onwards, kind of May, June onwards, kind of um, further lockdowns kind of permitting. Clearly the media business will have suffered at the moment as a result of the down decline in kind of travel and leisure um, events and as a result advertising. Um, but one of the things that I think is really stand out about Time Out, incredibly, despite the fact that Time Out is, is entirely focused on what you do when you go out and the best way to enjoy a particular city, despite that, the audience has remained reasonably flat, um, you know, in attracting north of 65 million um, eyeballs a month. Now, when you consider that the markets have been closed, so that's some of the audience gone, the magazines, we've stopped printing them and will only resume them in certain cities when that's economically viable. So that's not been in account. So in effect, the website traffic and the social media traffic has actually increased. And that's as a result of one, look, it's an incredible brand. It carries incredible authority still and trust, but also it re reorientated itself towards homebound content, news content, and also has been the source of news about what is opening up and, and when it opens up. Uh, and that's meant that it's kept its audience engaged. And that's incredibly important when things do start to open up again, because it guarantees us the kind of programmatic digital advertising revenue um, when, when people wish to start spending again. And it ensures us that the credibility of the market still retains uh, and the importance of the brands. So um, we announced yesterday um, that we've withdrawn from the heavy capex project that was Waterloo um, because we're reorientating our focus on kind of management agreements which essentially kind of franchised markets which give us a better return we're focusing on using less capital and increasing our margins um, and also we are considering the offer uh, of an equity raise proposal all of which will update the market on more on Tuesday. Great thank you. Um, from my perspective as the analyst, yeah, the, to put it into a context, A, it's small. Um, the other thing is when I look at it compared to other leisure slash restaurant groups, many of those have seen the share price yeah, double, in some cases even more, um, since their lows, and obviously timeout has been reasonably stable. So when I look at it, I look at the, the risk and the reward. You know, what's the downside risk from here relative to the upside? Yeah, for a relatively small okay. investment, to me, it looks like it's sort of an option on the upside I when, when it moves with others. So. Completely agree, Mark. As you say, it's kind of 5 6% of NAV. It's sitting broadly around the rights issue we had at May last year. Um, you know, the, the, the headwinds that business has suffered is absolutely in the price. Um, you know, the, the nice indication from yesterday shows that people really want to, to finance this business. And that would imply that that financing, you know, doesn't depend necessarily on OCI, which I think is, which is important. Uh, and as you say, it kind of there's there's optionality there from the OCI investors' perspective on, on, on the upside from here. And, and maybe it's worth sorry. Well, I didn't touch on in terms of you know we talk about you know downside. Is it okay if I touch on something like Career Partner Group where yeah. where, where there's upside? Because it'd be remiss of me not to kind of. We, we saw that um, Time Out took 30 pence off the, the NAV, but um, probably just as importantly for, for the NAV last year and for the, for the NAV going forward is Career Partner Group. Um, and, and I touched it, for those, for those less familiar with it, it's, it's Germany's now largest university and fastest growing university. And it's essentially achieved that by being focused on online education. And it's and it's so that's a relatively young market, incredibly in Germany on our education. Most of the people who provide it are kind of state funded, and what it's undoing for the first what it's doing for the first time is unlocking a section of the market that previously hasn't been addressed. So that is kind of students who don't necessarily want to go straight to university, want to start a job first. Those who maybe can't afford to go to university, mature adults who maybe in work or have family, they either want to do a degree for the first time or they're thinking about retraining, or they're thinking about career-orientated um, education. 
and career partner is the is the obvious leading solution there. And of course, in the current environment, which has involved a lot of change for a lot of people, that has also fed into that particular dynamic. And just to kind of give you some numbers behind what that's meant for us, um, when we acquired the business in 2018, it had roughly about 15,000 students um, and was doing a similar number in, in, in EBITDA. And since acquiring it, the student numbers have um, quadrupled in those three years. Um, and the, the EBITDA this year, reported EBITDA this year, is around about 40 million. But the run rate EBITDA is more like double that number. And so whilst it's clearly had a big impact on our growth this year, that is not entirely, COVID would have clearly assisted that, um, but that is not COVID based. And, and I think there's real confidence at Oakley that Career Partner Group can continue to deliver the kind of growth and obviously the value accretion um, for OCI kind of this year and next year. That's great. The FCA will be happy. Um, our, our, our registration requires us to give a balanced view. So a bit on the upside and a bit on the downside. <laughs> really well. Um, the second issue that we really highlighted in our note was about sustainability going forward as opposed to what's delivered in, in 2020. And what we particularly identify is the opportunities and that the cohorts of investing immediately after market disruption have historically been amongst some of the best across private equity as a whole. And that what we see is opportunities where yeah, subsidiaries are sold out of big groups in order to strengthen the big group um, balance sheets, so more carve outs that some family owned businesses, you get to the situation where the hassles of running the business in the past year have all been too, too much. Uh, and there are some relative valuation opportunities, uh, of course. Um, it's very noticeable from the market data that in the sectors most affected by COVID, there hasn't been that much PE activities. Whereas in those sectors which have not been that affected, which is obviously yours, yeah, there's been continued activity. So can you just walk us through about how you see you know, origination from here, the opportunities from here, and, and what you can bring that's unique? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Mark. I think, I think it's, a, it's a really relevant question, and one, obviously, what, look, frankly, we kind of get the question every year. You know, well done on your performance last year, but can you repeat it? Like, you, you're increasingly a known quantity. Surely, as your funds get bigger, you know, are you still able to, you know, find opportunities? And then even more so when you're saying, well, that's wonderful that you're invested in these digital solutions. But funnily enough, everyone would like a piece of that action. So how do you continue to, um, to access value? Um, and if there was one takeaway about the kind of value add or the thing that I think most defines Oakley in comparison to other PE and other investors, it is the way we originate. Um, and that is fundamental to that is the business founders that we back. And for those familiar with, with OCI, I'm sure you've heard myself or colleagues talk about the fact that you know, that the founder, when, when he conceived of the idea of, of Oakley Capital, really wanted to create a financial backer that he never had when he was developing businesses. It was a constant source of frustration that financial partners never really understood the challenges of building and growing a business. And although o Oakley Capital is now unrecognisable from the, from the group that started in the early 2000s, that's that vision is still very much the DNA of, of Oakley Capital. And as a consequence, we are very lucky in that we continue to attract really talented business founders and entrepreneurs. And the great thing about them, you know, when you go on to back them and have a certain amount of success with them, um, such as the strength of the relationship, they've done two things. One, invest actually into our funds. So of the funds we have managed currently, 200 million of that is, is being committed by the by the individuals we have backed. There's a nice alignment of interest there. Um, and in many cases, we've gone on to back them three or four times because of course, these individuals never stand still. There's, there's lots of opportunities that they identify or even companies that they're you know, already in, involved in. And the importance of that 
factor. There's probably about 20 now business founders that we have we have a kind of network with. Um, there's a wider group of that, but those are particularly individuals we've you know physically backed. Um, um, in in combination with the fact that unlike maybe some of our larger peers where this really doesn't make sense for them, we're very happy to kind of tackle some level of complexity as part of the transaction. And what I mean by that is, is that we are not dealing with a company that is in any way, many of the cases has not been prepared for sale. It hasn't got its, its data room ready with a, all its accounts in position, all the, all the information out there. Um, we're talking about businesses where they may not be accounts associated with that company at all, no formal accounting. They may not have certain areas of management in place. Um, they may have had no kind of strategy guiding the company because they might have been a small forgotten element of a larger fund or an orphan asset. And it's and, and either through our own screening for, or for the help of a, of a founder, we have unearthed this particular opportunity and we're willing to deal with the messiness of, of, of um, discovery in order to determine you know, whether the assets should be purchased and ultimately purchase it. And those two things combined, they certainly do one thing, which is enable us to find opportunities that aren't available um, to, to everyone, but they essentially um, mean two things. One, a large number of the deals we do are off market. And by that, I mean, they're not part of some formal process. 75% of the companies that we have invested in have have not been contested that there, there haven't been com people competing against us to buy the asset that's probably you know the 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 most interesting stat on the page i would argue to bear out that compl complexity point 40 percent of the deals we've done have been some kind of carve out out of a, a kind of a larger parent and that's the way you're kind of unlocking unlocking value and, and why are we so against you know um um, competitive processes or, or auctions look they they could at times throw up very interesting opportunities for us and, and it's and it's a you know it's a it's a method that functions perfectly well within PE the problem for us is and particularly our scale is it's very hard for us to have information advantage in those particular situations the times when we're going to be successful within within an auction is going to be because we have a really strong knowledge of the company and probably more importantly, we already have a pre-existing relationship with the management such that um, they, um, it puts us in a maybe a much more confident position about the kind of future performance as a business that maybe, maybe those competing against us would have. The other point that really speaks to this value point and our ability to not only find companies, um, but also still unearth value is that in, in in many cases, you know, with the first P investor in, and at that particular point in time, the owner of that business, if they're very much still operating that business, the point when they invite us in isn't a point of, of, of value maximization. They're not looking for the highest price to exit the business. They're looking to bring on a partner at that point in time to help them grow the business and to bring expertise that maybe they don't have at that particular point. You know, that could be anything from M&A or internationalization or even helping them kind of build a, a kind of senior management team. Um, and I think that's inc incredibly important at the point in the business that we're that we're buying into them. Now, these are established businesses, profitable businesses. Um, you know, we're not talking about venture capital here. You know, these are you know companies you know, that, that are generating anywhere from 10 to 100 plus million EBITDA. These are established companies, um, but they typically still have the business founder at the helm. Um, in terms of just to kind of think that that really kind of addresses this point about how we repeat it. And, and also, I guess, to that point, we've been, we've been pretty active to kind of demonstrate that we can, you know, despite the kind of disruption of COVID, we can still operate. We've made you know, four new platform investments in the last year and four bolt-ons. So you know, it, it clearly proves that even in the current environment, the model still works. And to kind of bear that out, our pipeline of opportunities for the year ahead is probably as, well, it's bigger than it's ever been. A last count, we had somewhere in the region of 180 opportunities. Now, clearly they are all at very different stages, you know, many of which will be at an early stage discussion 
40 of which might be an immediate prospect, you know, down to maybe we're doing DD and a couple of those. But I think the most important stat is that circa 70% of those companies we have sourced in a proprietary fashion, i.e. they've been introduced to us via, via you know, our network. They, we have approached them as a result of some screening. But at the point at this point in time, 70% of those companies at the point of contact are not part of some kind of sale process at that particular point. Um, <laughs> No, sorry. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> just comes to, just comes to time. Sorry, I mean, yeah, you're 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 right. I, I'll just pick up on and I'll I'll ask Alice just to flash up a slide as well that just that just talks about the fact that the other thing, the key thing about private equity is that you are in, in control of your own destiny to some extent. And that it's not just a case of you know acquire a business in the way you might do as a public market investor, you know, whether you're, you know, a BlackRock or Fidelity fund manager or whether you're a private investor, you buy the asset and, you know, you, you, you hope it goes to plan. Here we're taking a, you know, majority stake, a controlling stake, we're on the board. And, you know, I've, I've, we've just flashed up there, you know, some of the ways in which we can proactively create value um, and that we will be creating value kind of, you know, going forward um this this year onwards just to kind of touch on that kind of outlook point of yours um sorry mark oh, yeah, 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 no problem. I, mean, I mean for me i think the single most important issue was they've got 200 million involved so it's completely 100 percent a symbiotic relationship it's in their interest to help uh you've touched on here about how they they help operationally which was you know, one of my introductory points the other thing which i would mention is that they also as a network typically will assist in terms of the disposal side as the exit side as well. Uh, so I mean, obviously exits are planned right from the start before an acquisition is made, but having the network of people in the market that know it uh, is very useful. Um, talking exits and you, you know, sort of the average 44% uplift on, on exit leads into a subject where we've had actually multiple questions in advance. Uh, thank you, David and Bill. Uh, we've also had a couple of questions uh, live uh, which really feeds into valuations and how you go about valuations and how we can be sure valuations are realistic, etc. I'll just make uh, a, a couple of points which I think are, are really important. If you follow the basic investment maxim of follow the cash, the accounting NAV at any given time actually doesn't really matter that much. Yeah, the Oakleys get their performance fee on exit that's when it matters and that's a real price. So there's absolutely no incentive to inflate or deflate an NAV en route. The second point which I would make is that at 44% uplift to the last closing NAV, and different PE companies do it on a, a slightly different basis. Some do it to three, six, 12 months before, others include exclude fees, yours are after all the fees. So that's, that's the real drop down number. If you think of that 44% exit, think of a normal yeah, public listed business. When they sell out, you look for a premium of about 30%. So the premiums which are being got on exit are higher than you might expect from a deal in the public markets. That, to me, gives a really good degree of comfort that the actual carrying value is a very realistic number. So I think that, that that's really important. Um, Perhaps, Stephen, you can take us through some of the metrics, some of the approaches, some of the, the nitty gritty. Yeah, look, it's a really it's a really interesting subject, isn't it, around valuation? You know, I think the fear you always assume, you know, with the with the fact that the that the share price discount or no discount is always lagging the nav, even in you know the case of those that kind of track more closely, um, would imply that the market doesn't have confidence in the nav. And yet, of course, particularly for direct listed PE, there is this long run track record of, of achieving premiums to, to NAV. So um, just to, to kind of tackle that initial question, which is around, so how do we value the existing portfolio? And um, I guess there's two, there's two things to consider. Like most of our peers, there are pretty clear, clear guidelines. So there's the international PE and, and venture capital valuation guidelines that we essentially ascribe to. Um, how the businesses we we revalue the portfolio twice a year currently 
that's in June and December. We've kind of made a statement that we would we would like to move that to quarterly revaluations, but let's just stick to where we currently are. And at the moment, um, in December, they're independently valued and independently audited. And in June, they're essentially Oakley generated um, valuations. And so let's focus on the process where they're kind of, you know, that we've just gone through, which was the independent valuation. The, the way the process is conducted at the moment is that the independent value in this case is Grant Thornton. They will, they will take from Oakley um, all the financial information that, that we can provide them with any of our knowledge around kind of peer group analysis um, or any, you know, any work we've done around the kind of um, sector. And taking that, they produce essentially valuation ranges, which they, which they look to kind of establish you know, somewhere in the middle of. Uh, and subsequent to that, KPMG then aud audit their work. So, and then, it, and then it's a case of like, you can create obviously large peer groups. Um, what you're clearly looking for is as close as you can, the closest level of relevance possible within the private or public arena. Clearly public offers live pricing and in the private arena, you're really relying upon activity within, within the sector to kind of get those multiples. That all said, and I think this clearly relates to, to the peers as well, but I'll speak just for Oakley. It, revenue, and probably more importantly, EBITDA, um, are going to be the dominant feature of evaluation, such that, and to explain that, that is the element that we can certify. The multiple we apply to that is, um, is, is subjective. You, you could provide as much science as possible, but essentially it's, it's limited by information and it's subjective because ultimately you never quite know until as Mark pointed out, you have a moment of, of realization. So what you'll tend to find is that the element that's driving evaluation will be the increasing EBITDA and there will be an EV EBITDA valuation, which I have to say will be heavily influenced by the price we pay, paid for that asset. Because frankly, that's the only clear factual point that you can point to is the last time that asset was sold, that's the price you had to pay for it. And whilst you believe you are creating a lot more value through its growth and through the, the scale you're creating, ultimately, you'll never know if you've created that multiple accretion until the point when you sell it. And that is typically what well, there's two elements of, of why you receive that kind of premium at pop because it's a number of things one we might be valuing a business in the way we have to watch reported EBITDA but actually as I might you know as I hinted on you know career partner group there's also run rate and performer EBITDAs that take into consideration the growth that you actually might be able to sell the business on um, and of course the multiples will probably be more anchored towards the price you pay for the business, but when you sell it, you can really get the, the increase in value. Inspired, we might have been holding in our books in the teens multiple, low teens, and we sold that you know, business for you know, more than 20 times its EBITDA multiple. Explaining why you saw that, you know, the kind of the big release in value at the point of, of sale. It's also the point in which you're allowing someone the control premium that someone has to pay as well when they buy a, a public market. I would also say, I mean, you've got a couple of additional checks in terms of a board which is now independent uh, and those pain in the arse analysts have asked all sorts of difficult questions if the valuation in any way is a bit funny. So, I mean, we start in a position where we're looking to discount of nearly 25%, uh, which is compares to a 3i HGT Apex, which are either at premiums or very, very small discounts. Um, so it's certainly at the higher end in terms of the peers. And I would actually think, from my perspective, I'd, I'd put it into a context. Yeah, 25%, that is the equivalent of one year's EBITDA growth. It is the equivalent of just over half the uplift on the valuation that you've actually achieved on exit. If you look at this as a five-year investment, it would be a sixth of the total return that you might expect if the discount was eliminated completely. It's a, it's a nice to have, but it's not really the, the key driver. Yeah. 
you're buying Oakley for long-term capital growth as a long-term investment. And within that, it's nice noise potential. It's, an, it's a nice entry point as opposed, as opposed to anything else. But perhaps you could take us through a bit about what you've done in the past to manage the discount, what you're doing now to manage discount, a little bit about dividends, because I've had, had a few questions about dividends. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I'm completely in agreement with you, is that the you know, OCI's capital growth is ultimately the reason why I own OCI and why I'd encourage anyone else to own OCI. And I think the key reason for that being is that, look, it's, it's high, it's consistent, and it's the thing we have the biggest control over. That said, and frankly, if you buy a 20% disc 25% discount, you know, the, the you know, it's kind of the discount's there, it's in the price. Um, clearly, it's an attractive prospect to see that discount close. Um, and also, frankly, we are very focused on doing what we can to close that discount. And we understand that for many, it's a potential alarm signal that says, is, is there a reason I shouldn't be buying OCI? So perversely, HG that might be trading at par might attract, you know, typically attract uh, an investor because it's not trading on a discount. So, you know, I, I think we, you know, are unequivocally focused on closing it, but I would reiterate that we can, you know, we can do a number of these things, but that doesn't necessarily guarantee that we can close it. Um, we included in the appendix of our investor presentation two slides, which summarised exactly you know, what we have done over the last really three years is when we've, we've, we've focused on, on the discounts uh, and what we've achieved to date. And then I'll move on to a second slide shortly, which really covers um, the things that we can continue to do. And for those less familiar with OCI, it also gives you some kind of history as to why the, why the business may have, uh, have um, traded at a discount in the past. And, and I'll, 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 I'll move relatively swiftly through this list because arguably it's the list that's being addressed. Um, but clearly, you know, one of the, one of the key um, crimes of the business in the past was that it had, had issued new shares at a discount at NAV, so they were dilutive. And, you know, for, for a number of years now, we have committed to the fact that we, we will never do that again. We've made public statements to that effect. There was very little alignment of interest between the OCI board and the partners of Oakley. And that's really been addressed by the fact that they have been steadily accruing their own stake in OCI. And now that exceeds 10% um, of OCI. So there's a stronger alignment of interest there between the manager and OCI, which I think is helpful. Um, in terms of returning cash, we did introduce a dividend um, of um, a four and a half pence. And that dividend has been maintained um, ever since. I'm, I'm conscious that you know whether it's buybacks or dividends, everyone has a kind of different, a different view on this and the potency of either measure or the appeal of each measure and whether or not one is you know more tax efficient than the other. I think the starts we take here, and to be as candid as possible, is that we have committed to maintaining that dividend, and we certainly haven't committed to kind of growing it. Now I recognise that you there is an argument for paying out more of your capital in, in, in dividends. It used to be supported by the, you know, the income of the direct investments, but on the basis that we're winding down the direct investments, um, that's arguably less relevant. I think our view is that this is a capital growth story and paying out cash in dividends really you know, doesn't, doesn't serve that purpose. It's not an obvious income vehicle and you don't attract the big income players that would help value a business accordingly. I don't, I don't know, Mark, at that point of view, you want to interject at all on your views on dividends. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we've done a various analyses of, of benefit of dividends, yeah, not only in private equity, but across the whole of the uh, investment company space. Yeah, there are certain individual companies where you may say it might have had an effect. But when we look at sectors, when we look at subsectors, when we look across whether high dividend protected companies in downturns or yeah, difficult market conditions, uh, whether there were material changes in shareholder bases, there wasn't a material difference. And if we actually look at the dividend that OCI has been paying from when it was introduced, it does not look like it was a material driver to the discount in OCI specifically. So 
yeah, to, to my to my mind, it's not an important driver. I would also just touch that, Stephen, you mentioned about yeah, selling direct investments. Um, I introduced the business by saying, yeah, looking through all the terminology and all the legal structures and everything. The most of the investments have been held through Oakley Capital Funds, um, but they are those funds are the actual investments. There were a few investments that were held separately. So those were the direct investments that Stephen was mentioning. It is, it is a direct, uh, economically, OCI is a direct investor now. So I'd just touch on that. So I, I interrupted you, Stephen. No, not at all. And, and, and so look, I completely recognise that for some, you know, where income is quite hard to, you know, to find at the moment, then I can see the appeal of a higher dividend. Um, I, would, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't create any anticipation that, that we're going to be a large dividend payer in, in the future, at least, you know, not in the foreseeable future. Um, buybacks are a, are a program we are supportive of, uh, and obviously we touched on that, the program uh, last year. Uh, I wouldn't, I would suggest that we're maybe not as going to be as large a buyer back to that scale. We, we really kind of kept powder dry over the last couple of years because there were significant blocks of shares that needed to be placed, and we've kind of really um, dealt with that with a large amount of the shareholder base having to turn over, uh, which kind of talks to that kind of uh, fifth point on the screen there. Um, you know, we, we had 55% of the shares were held by two shareholders only a couple of years ago, and both those shareholders, the fund managers have left the industry and those positions have, have subsequently been placed. Um, and, and the top 10 shareholders now are more like 60% of the register when they were close to 100% of the register kind of three, four years back. So you have a much more functioning register now than you had. And it was quite obvious why um, with no liquidity um, and with big overhangs, why the shares you know, were, were really not re kind of responding at that time. We've also come a long way in the meantime. I mean, just, you know, not just you know, engaging with people like Mark to kind of help um, analyze the, the story and kind of tell the story to a wider market, but also in terms of how we present our own information. And I think now we're increasingly being seen as best in class um, in this particular area rather than worst in class. Um, we've moved off aim to the specialist fund segment to, to, to explain the specialist fund segment is an, is an expert segment within the London Stock Exchange kind of main market. We, we, work, we didn't qualify for a main or premium list at the point we made that move because of investment concentration. We understand that there are a couple of platforms that don't allow retail trade in the specialist fund segment, and they are Barclays and Halifax. Um, but most, most all other retail platforms do allow trade in that segment. It is our intention when we are in a position to, to do so, to make that kind of move on to the premium list. We'll touch on that on the next slide. The board has changed immeasurably in, um, in its independence and le level of tenure in the last couple of years. And Mark touched on those direct investments, which now no longer attract a kind of management or performance fee. So these are all things addressed. Now, I would say at this particular point, you know, the frustration of an investor, and I've spoken to some very, you know, kind of um, experienced and, you know, high performing investors. And they're like, you've done everything we asked for. You know, it's so frustrating that discount still persists. And, and I kind of say to them, just, just because we've done it does not mean that it's immediately reflected in, in the share price. And I think for a number of reasons. Um, one, um, perception lags fact. So you know, you've, got to, you've got to wait for, you know, that to, to, kind, of, to, to, to kind of come through. The stock market is inefficient. And so we are not nearly well known as a, 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 an HG Capital or an Apex or a 3I. I mean, that's a, that's a stated and undisputed fact. And so we have to, you know, continue to work hard to kind of build up that, that name. And also we have had a lot of stock overhangs to deal with. That creates indigestion. It sucks a lot of buying interest into one or two pinch points. And it's only really in the last few months that we've stopped being in that position. Um, if we, if we look at the kind of things that we still believe we have to, to tackle, um, one is those direct investments that we referenced. Um, so we have made investments in direct debt um, and direct equity into the underlying portfolio companies. And one of the concerns of the past is that one, they haven't performed as well as the funds. 
And secondly, is there a conflict of interest? Is OCI making an investment in the debt of a company or the equity of a company because it's in the best interest of, of OCI or, or the portfolio companies? And so we have made a very clear stand to say that we, we are winding those down. There could be some great opportunities there, but it's far better to be as simple and vanilla as possible. And I think if we can wind down those positions, they'll do a number of things. It'll, it'll, it'll over-index into the funds. So the NAV can be 85% the equity funds and you know, 15, 20% um, in cash. There's always going to have to be an element of cash ready to kind of meet the drawdowns. It will stop the focus on the kind of older and, 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 and those assets which have been kind of more troublesome or certainly taking a longer time to turn around. And in that case, I'm talking about kind of timeout um, and North sales. Um, and it will take away that kind of um, concern around conflicts of interest. So that's the, that's the number one thing we can do and that we're focused on doing. And I would set the time scale for achieving that in the 12 to 24 months. Um, we talked about half yearly reporting. And although most funds only completely revalue their portfolio on, you know, twice a year, they'd also put out quarterly updates in which they um, factor in any transactions or, or effects. Our plan is to move to a full revaluation of the portfolio four times a year. Um, we hoped to do, to do that from Q3. I can't absolutely kind of promise that. It could be Q1 of, um, uh, of next year, but that will certainly be something we'll be moving to, which I think will hopefully help in terms of providing the market with that visibility, with that confidence that the NAV is moving in the direction that they would anticipate it to be. I've already touched on the market move, which I think will be helpful. And then finally, the investor profile. I mean, if you look at this time last year, as we sat here, um, we had 14% of our register that was held by private wealth managers or private wealth. I mean, that is well, well below what you might expect typical for an investment company, let alone a direct investment company. If you looked at an HG, for example, their top proliferating their top 10 are the retail wealth platforms. A year on, and thanks to the ability for us to reach an audience like this, um, we're more like 20%. So improving, um, but, but still some way to go. And I think we can do a lot, not just in our continued performance um, and, and, and in some of these measures that, that, that man would not address the discount, but we can do a lot to do more to improve our profile and to help you know, more people understand this story and attract more people um, to the register. And look, we started to see you know, day to day that kind of the more regular trading liquidity creep up. We finally kind of moved through the kind of three pound level. Uh, and I think we're pretty optimistic on the level of engagement that we're seeing, that Hardman's seeing, that, that that's a trend that will continue. I think we've covered a lot actually through the course of the presentation. Uh, one that we haven't covered is if the company were to go to a NAF premium, would the board push for a new capital raise? It's possible. I mean, I, <clears throat> I think the only reason you, you would justify that is, is the ability to, to commit more funds to new Oakley funds as they open. At this moment in time, we have typically tried OCI where it can to try to get as much into the funds as possible. And we've, we've roughly been allowed because of our kind of legacy relationship with Oakley to take about 30% of, of any new fund. And that's essentially what we have in terms of our stake in fund four and, and the origin fund. Clearly we would like to maintain that position. And at the moment, the returns of the funds and the cash that's flowing back into OCI has enabled us to continue to do that. So, that has been the source, a growing source of you know, returns and cash has kind of allowed us to commit. If in time with more funds and more ways to access returns through Oakley and we were trading a premium, it, it's a possibility that that would be one way we'll be to issue new shares. But frankly, we have, we have never been in a position to discuss it since the day we IPO'd. So it's, it's for the future. Um, <laughs> A second question was, you raised 28 million through the Career Partner Group free financing on the 1st of March, when I'd expected you to run the investment. I thought, this is from Alistair, thank you. Um, was that OCI's choice or was it Career Partners' decision? Uh, will Oakley control all future liquidity events for Career Partner investments? 
Yeah, I mean, I think any anything that we do, we do it in conjunction with the, the management. Remember, are our owners of that business as well. Although we have a control investment in nearly all of our investments, um, unless we have sold an asset and retained a minority stake, that is not the case with Career Partner Group. And in the case of Career Partner Group, we are essentially we were essentially refinanced the debt of the business and took more debt, enabling us to de-risk the equity element. So we've essentially returned to the LPs our investment committed in, in Career Partner Group to date, but we will still retain the exact equity stake that we started with. So we are absolutely looking to retain and run that investment for a couple of more years to go. And that's one of our key learnings actually from, from the last 10, 12 years is running our investments for as, for as long as possible reasonably possible under, understanding the constraints of the funds because obviously you invest over five and you harvest over five um, our average hold hold length of time is about three and a half years i think for our you know really strong performing assets the average should be uh, a lot higher and i'm sure that's our mindset with career partner group um, so the decision making is very much oakley's it, it, when it, particularly when it comes to something at the funds, it, it's not OCI. It's OCI is a one, one of a number of limited partners in the funds and, and they are a beneficiary of the fund's performance, but they don't have an active role to play in the management of the underlying portfolio companies, nor financing decisions. One, one final question, we've got one minute. If new shares, this is a follow-up from the last one, uh, if new shares are issued to raise capital, will private investors be involved rather than it being a placing? Uh, look, uh, uh, I mean, we are really talking about the kind of the future here, but I think um, I think the mindset would be that we would be looking to uh, I, I, our approach has always been to try and engage to allow as many of the current investor base to participate. And what we're hoping to build is a very strong retail following. So absolutely key to us will be to ensure that every single shareholder can participate. But as I say, you know, we are talking about an incredibly theoretical position as we sit here on the discount we're currently sitting at. OK, well, we're actually going to sneak in a final one. So, so Richard, typically, how long does a student stay as a student within Career Partners Group, i.e. what is the uh, is that cliff or difference from a revenue perspective? Uh, so an average course is about three years. Average duration in which they in which they stay with career partner group will be in the two plus something years. I don't know the exact number. You, you, because of the flexible nature of the course, it's you'll get a higher dropout rate just by nature of some people wanting to do one year of a course or two years of a course because of their circumstances changing in a way that a student committing to a um, into a campus degree is unlikely to change, um, change directions. Um, but it has, in terms of completion rates, it has one of the highest completion rates of any um, uh, online education provider kind of globally. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much, Stephen. Thank you very much, Alice. If anybody has any further questions, either direct them to us or to Stephen and Alice. Uh, we've had a couple of requests for slide packs, which obviously we'll, we can sort out. Um, but um, thank you, every. Thank you for listening. Um, and uh, thank you and goodbye. <laughs> Thanks, Mark.